Have you ever found yourself caught in a loop, repeating behaviors you desperately want to change, but somehow you can't seem to break free? It's like being stuck in a room with no doors, only windows showing you a different life you can't quite reach. This isn't about a lack of willpower or a flaw in your character. This is where behavior therapy steps in, not as a quick fix, but as a journey, a scientific approach to understanding and reshaping the very actions that define your daily life. Let me tell you about an experiment that, although controversial, really highlights how we learn and how those lessons shape us. In 1913, John Watson, a name you might recognize from psychology, conducted the Little Albert experiment. Watson, alongside his graduate student Rosalie Rayner, showed how fears could be learned by conditioning a nine-month-old, infant known as Little Albert, to fear a white rat, something he initially wasn't afraid of. They did this by repeatedly pairing the rat's appearance with a sudden, loud noise. This is a prime example of classical conditioning. Now you might think, how does this relate to my own struggles? Well, how many of your current reactions, fears, or even joys are linked to associations you're not fully aware of? Little Albert, who initially showed no fear of the rat, began to exhibit fear responses, not just to the rat, but also to similar objects like a rabbit, a dog, and even a Santa Claus mask. This illustrated how learned associations can generalize to other things, and it was all done in a controlled setting, demonstrating that fear could indeed be a learned response. This brings us to another influential figure in the field of psychology, Ivan Pavlov. He was a Russian physiologist whose work with dogs in the late 19th and early 20th centuries revolutionized our understanding of learning through association. You might have heard the term Pavlov's dogs. Initially, Pavlov was studying the digestive system of dogs when he noticed something intriguing. The dogs began to salivate, not just when they saw food, but also at the sound of the lab assistant's footsteps, the person who usually brought the food. It dawned on Pavlov that the dogs had linked the sound of the footsteps with the arrival of food. In his now famous experiments, Pavlov paired the presentation of food, which naturally caused salivation, with a neutral stimulus, like the ringing of a bell. After several pairings, the dogs began to salivate just from hearing the bell, even when no food was presented. This was groundbreaking. It showed that a neutral stimulus could become a conditioned stimulus, triggering a conditioned response, in this case salivation, because of its link with an unconditioned stimulus, the food. This process, which Pavlov named classical conditioning, is a cornerstone of behaviorism. It explains how we develop responses to various things in our environment. And it's not just about dogs and bells. It helps explain why you might flinch at the sound of a dentist's drill or feel a surge of joy when a particular song plays. These are learned associations deeply ingrained in your behavior. Now, let's shift gears and talk about B.F. Skinner, who in the mid-20th century took these concepts and expanded upon them with his theory of operant conditioning. Skinner's work delved into how consequences shape behavior. He designed what's famously known as the Skinner Box, a controlled environment where animals like rats or pigeons could learn to perform specific actions, such as pressing a lever to get a reward, typically food. Skinner demonstrated that behaviors followed by positive outcomes, like receiving food, were more likely to be repeated. This is known as reinforcement. Conversely, behaviors followed by negative outcomes or punishments were less likely to happen again. It might sound straightforward, but consider its implications. How many of your own actions are driven by seeking something positive or avoiding something negative? Around the same time as Pavlov, Edward Thorndike was also making significant contributions to this field. His experiments involving cats in puzzle boxes showed that animals learn through trial and error. Thorndike placed hungry cats inside, boxes from which they could escape and get food by performing a specific action, like pulling a loop or pressing a lever. At first, the cats would engage in random behaviors, but eventually they would accidentally do the right action and escape. Over repeated trials, the cats became quicker and quicker at escaping, which suggested that they were learning the connection between the action and the reward. Thorndike's work led to what he called the law of effect, which states that behaviors 
followed by satisfying consequences, are more likely to be repeated, while those followed by unpleasant consequences are less likely to be repeated. This principle is fundamental to understanding how learning happens. These pioneers, Pavlov, Watson, Skinner and Thorndike, weren't just playing around with animals in labs. They were uncovering the basic principles of learning, principles that apply to each and every one of us. They were demonstrating that behavior isn't random, it's learned. And if it's learned, that means it can be unlearned and modified. This is where behavior therapy comes in. It takes these foundational principles and applies them to help you change behaviors you're not happy with. It's a collaborative process. You work with a therapist to pinpoint specific behaviors you want to change, and then you create a plan together to reach your goals. It doesn't involve digging into your past or uncovering hidden unconscious conflicts. Instead, it focuses on the present, on the here and now. What are you doing that you want to do differently? What triggers these behaviors? What are the consequences that keep them going? One of the core methods used in behavior therapy is exposure. Now that might sound a bit scary, especially if you're dealing with anxiety or phobias. However, exposure is done very carefully and gradually. You slowly confront your fears in a safe and controlled environment. For instance, imagine someone with a fear of spiders. Instead of forcing them to hold a tarantula right away, a therapist might start by simply having them look at pictures of spiders. Then gradually over time, the person might move on to watching videos of spiders, then being in the same room as a spider in a closed container, and eventually they might be able to hold a spider. This step-by-step -step process is known as systematic desensitization. It helps reduce the fear response by pairing the feared thing with relaxation techniques, little by little. Another important technique is reinforcement. This is where Skinner's operant conditioning really comes into play. By identifying and rewarding desired behaviors, you can make them happen more often. Reinforcement can be positive, which means adding something pleasant after a good behavior, like treating yourself to a fun activity after finishing a tough task. It can also be negative, which involves removing something unpleasant after a desired behavior, like the relief you feel after finally tackling that messy room you've been avoiding. Think about how we learn new skills, that's where modeling comes in. It's a powerful tool, especially when you're trying to pick up new habits or abilities. It basically involves watching and imitating others. Remember when you were learning to drive? You probably spent hours watching your parents or a driving instructor before you ever took the wheel yourself. In therapy, modeling can be used to learn social skills, assertiveness, or even ways to manage tough emotions. The therapist might model the desired behavior, or you might watch videos or observe others in a group setting. It's all about learning by example. And then there's social skills training. This is where you actively learn and practice skills to improve how you interact with others. You might do role-playing, acting out different social situations with your therapist, getting feedback and guidance along the way. Maybe you learn how to start a conversation, how to say no without feeling guilty, or how to express your feelings more clearly. These skills can make a huge difference in building stronger relationships and just feeling better about yourself in social situations. We also can't underestimate the power of controlling your environment. This means changing your surroundings to make it easier to do the things you want to do and harder to do the things you don't. For example, if you're trying to eat healthier, you might clear out all the junk food from your house and fill your kitchen with nutritious options. If you're trying to cut down on screen time, you might leave your phone in another room while you're working or spending time with family. These changes might seem small, but they can have a surprisingly big impact on your behavior. Relaxation techniques are another key part of this whole approach. Things like progressive muscle relaxation or deep breathing exercises can help you deal with stress and anxiety, which are often at the root of unwanted behaviors. By learning to calm your body and mind, you create a space where you can make more intentional choices about your actions. With progressive muscle relaxation, for example, you systematically tense and then release different muscle groups in your body, one by one, from your toes all the way up to your forehead. As you tense each muscle group, you hold it for a few seconds, really paying attention to that feeling of tightness. Then, as you let go, 
you focus on the feeling of relaxation that follows. The aim is to get better at recognizing the physical signs of tension and relaxation. That way, you can learn to consciously release tension whenever you feel it building up. It's like learning a new language, your body's language, and figuring out how to use it to create a sense of calm. And let's not forget about self-monitoring. This is all about keeping track of your own behaviors, thoughts, and feelings. You might use a journal, an app, or even just make mental notes. The goal is to become more aware of your patterns and to spot the triggers for your behaviors. For instance, you might notice that you tend to overeat when you're feeling stressed or that you're more likely to procrastinate when you're tired. This kind of awareness is the first step toward making real, lasting changes. It's like turning a spotlight on your own behavior, illuminating patterns you might never have noticed before. Behavior therapy isn't just for people facing serious mental health challenges. It can be helpful for anyone who wants to make positive changes in their lives. Maybe you want to quit smoking, get more exercise, improve your sleep, or handle your anger better. Whatever your goal, behavior therapy can give you the tools and strategies you need to succeed. It's used to treat a wide variety of conditions, including anxiety disorders like phobias, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder. It's also effective for obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, eating disorders, and substance abuse. For kids and teens, it can help with behavior problems like aggression, defiance, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. One of the best things about behavior therapy is that it's an active and collaborative process. You're not just passively receiving treatment. You're an active participant, working together with your therapist to set goals, come up with strategies, and track your progress. You essentially learn to become your own therapist, gaining the skills and tools you need to manage your behavior and keep up your progress even after therapy sessions have ended. It's an empowering process that puts you in the driver's seat of your own life. Now, I want to be clear, behavior therapy isn't about controlling or manipulating people. It's about empowering individuals to take charge of their own behavior and make choices that align with their values and goals. It's about understanding the science of how we learn and using that knowledge to create positive change. It's a journey of self-discovery, learning, and ultimately, growth. Sure, it requires effort, commitment, and stepping outside your comfort zone. But the rewards can be truly life-changing. You might find yourself breaking free from old patterns that have been holding you back, gaining new skills and coping mechanisms, and building a life that feels more fulfilling and meaningful. So, if you're ready to take that first step, if you're curious about exploring how to change your behavior, then I'd say give behavior therapy a look. It's not a magic solution, but it's a powerful set of tools that can help you unlock your potential and create the life you want. Remember, change is possible. It starts with understanding, grows with action, and blossoms into a life lived more. Consciously and intentionally, you have the power within you to shape your behavior, to shape your life, and to create a future that's brighter and more fulfilling than you ever imagined. This isn't just about changing what you do, it's about changing your life one step at a time, one behavior at a time. And that, I think, is the most powerful lesson of all. It's in your hands. The journey is yours and the destination is a life lived more fully, more authentically, and more in line with who you truly want to be. The path is there, waiting for you to take that first step and then the next, and the next until you find yourself somewhere you never thought possible, a place of growth, of change, of transformation.